Yay. I love, I love how this is all coming together. It's something that I have personally been working towards for, I don't know, like 10 years or so. Um, I'm still not anywhere close to um, perfect. And this pandemic was kind of like an eye opener because I've been working towards not complete self-sufficiency. That's never been my goal, but just being more stable than I was. And even for how much effort I put into it, it's still amazing how many um, uh, gaps there can be in your, your, your system. So uh, tonight we are going to be talking about six steps to self-sufficiency and how that can actually be very different um, for each person and for what they choose to focus on. So um, I do have a lot of people here tonight that I haven't gotten the opportunity to meet before. So I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Elise Pickett and I am the owner of The Urban Harvest. I have been teaching people in Florida how to vegetable garden now for three, um, so like eight, seven or eight years now. Um, I've recently gotten to go full-time with it. It's been wonderful. I'm also a full-time mommy with that little girl in that picture. That's my daughter, Layla. Um, but as far as the sustainability aspect, since we're talking about self-sufficiency, um, there was a few books that I read um, that really opened my eyes to the insecurities in our food system and just, you know, overall environmental health and conscientiousness. And I just really, that's what started my own personal journey into self-sufficiency. And it also led to my current business as the urban harvest, teaching people how to vegetable garden, because I realized that there's been a, a gap in the information system that we have. And so this, a lot of the things that we're supposed to just kind of know um, for the longest time, we haven't had to pass down. So it used to be passed down because it was part of your life and it was from your mom and your dad and your grandparents and everything like that. And because we've um, been so lucky for so long that that wasn't needed anymore. And so now if you are interested in um, gaining a little self-sufficiency or resiliency in your life, you're kind of starting from square one oftentimes. You're, you're having to relearn everything that um, is traditionally passed down. And so I try, I'm trying to fill that gap with vegetable gardening, helping people learning how to grow their own food. So that is my mission and my goal. So that is also why tonight is such a wonderful topic for me. I always like to start my talks with a quote, and this one is by Michael Dell, um, and it says, there's always an opportunity to make a difference. And I think that a lot of times when we think of self-sufficiency, um, we oftentimes have a very um, narrow vision of that, but um, we're going to be talking a lot tonight about how it isn't necessarily just about our, our, our piece of the puzzle or our specific homestead, um, no matter how resilient we are, there's always, in, there's always influences in the world. And um, so we have the opportunity to make a tremendous difference, even if we are trying to maintain self-sufficiency for ourselves. Um, this is a pretty staggering um, reflection of our modern industrial food system. But 99% of the food um, in a grocery store comes from thousands of miles away. 99% of it, except for maybe the little end caps where they say local honey. Um, and, but it's been pretty exciting, but over the past decade or so, it's slowly starting to shift. There's been more consumer demands um, for keeping things a little bit more local than they used to be. And it's supported a blooming farmer's market um, industry. They're all over the country now. And it's becoming easier and easier to access locally sourced food, which is a beautiful thing. Um, but in specifically in regards to growing your own food, what I teach and what I um, support is everybody growing at least a little bit of their own food, right? So even if it's a single pot, a single container that you're growing some herbs in um, or you know one tomato plant because that's what your family really loves I am all for it so even just growing a little bit goes a really long way and what's really exciting of late is that one in three households are now growing their own food and that, that does not mean they're self-sufficient that just means they are growing some sort of produce that they can consume which I think is really pretty inspiring 
Um, and they did a study, um, the National Gardening Association did a study back in, um, well, I, I mean, I assume that it was around that time based on the financial crisis, but from 20, uh, 2008 to 2013, um, they took a survey. They did a survey for 42 million households and they looked at who was gardening um, and they did a whole bunch, a whole thorough study on ages and um, urban, suburban, um, nationality. They did a very intense study, but the gist of it is that people were starting um, in 2008, it was not a thing, <laughs> okay? But you can see how quickly it grew. Um, and it was a 17% increase in people growing their own food in just five years. Um, and what was pretty cool was 71% of them were in urban and suburban areas. So, so often we think we have to have huge plots of land that we need to be out in the country uh, to be able to grow our own food, that we have to be, have a farming background or something like that. But this just goes to show you that 71% of the people they surveyed are actually living in urban and suburban landscapes, which means you can grow food no matter where you live. Um, so this is a overview and my personal interpretation of things, but um, I find it very interesting and inspiring um, to take a look at gardening as a nation. So in the 1940s, um, it was World War II, and if you've never heard of Victory Gardens, it's kind of had a semi-resurgence. Um, they're calling them modern day Victory Gardens. Um, and that's really become very popular um, since this pandemic's been going around. Um, but in the 1940s, the Victory Garden was basically a call to our nation to start growing some of their own food and to help support themselves instead of relying on the government. Um, some of the farmers were overseas. Um, you know, it was just a system that was starting to collapse. And so they basically said, hey, we need your help we need you to start growing some of your own food. And these were average citizens, and that's what I find the most inspiring. So they, they, these weren't the farmers that have been doing it their whole lives. This was people reading pamphlets and getting some seeds and throwing them in the ground and figuring it out and making it work. And during that time, um, they estimate that there were 20 million gardens, um, home gardens, nothing on the farming scale. And it was about 14% of the population at that time. 14% was growing some of their own food. Um, and at that time, it actually equated to about 40% of the food consumed in our nation. So um, just 14% of the population was able to grow enough for 40% of um, the food consumed, which is pretty awesome. So then we're gonna jump forward. And this is kind of where, um, I'm interpreting, um, I think it probably had to do a little bit with the financial crisis and people being uncomfortable with the instability, um, not, not being um, able to purchase like they had in the past. And um, there, is, there is a lot of um, people in foreclosure and just a lot of stress in our world. And um, at that same time, whether they were related or not, um, Michelle Obama's Let's Move program they started a White House garden. And it's funny because Eleanor Roosevelt, um, that was the other garden that they've had at the White House was a victory garden um, with Eleanor Roosevelt. And then Michelle Obama started the um, vegetable garden as well that um, the Trumps are actually maintaining, which is pretty cool. But anyhow, um, there are, four, in 2008, there were 42 million gardens and that's about 13% of the population. So even though um, there was no, active call to people to grow their own food, um, whether it was people's uncertainty with the financial system or whether it was maybe um, the Let's Move program. Um, something, something changed um, and it got people growing again. And now here we are, um, not that much later than 2008, but um, there's this pandemic going around and a ton of economic uncertainty with all of these closures. People aren't sure what's going on. There are a lot of people out of jobs right now. It is a terrible situation to be in and no one really knows where it's going from here. But um, 
I would just like to say that we can reference um, our past as a nation and we can um, very quickly and very, um, very productively create um, localized food systems if we choose to. Um, the um, seed companies that I've been talking about, um, talking with, I order a lot of seed for my Florida Seed Club and um, I sell wholesale packets and stuff to people who are looking to garden and I've been talking with them because everything's been delayed. If you haven't, I don't know if you've tried ordering seed lately, but half the websites are completely shut down. Some of them are shipping like two weeks out, three weeks out when they used to ship in two days. Um, and they were saying that they've had a 500% increase in sales um, compared to their normal averages for this time of year, 500% increase. Um, so no, there have not been studies out, but um, clearly a demand or a focus has started in the food system, um, regardless of whether it is economic or um, health related. Um, I think that it is something that maybe we could take as a positive thing out of this um, situation is this growing awareness of our food system. So um, does anybody, oh, hello. Uh, dog and baby need a hug really quick and then it'll be, <laughs> we'll be able to move on. Good night, Layla. I love you. You wanna say bye-bye? Bye. -bye. <laughs> Maybe Good night. So regardless of whether um, we are looking at this from a self-sufficiency and resiliency standpoint or um, just from the um, general benefits that food, growing food can have for us, um, that same study, um, they were asking um, participants why it mattered to them, why they were growing food. Um, and a lot of people said um, it's better tasting if you've never had fresh grown produce. There's nothing like it. But there was also a lot um, about saving money and um, better quality food. So there's a lot of benefits that we can pull from it, even if it isn't the initial thought process behind it. And I also thought it was um, pretty cool to see. I grow in an urban setting. I have a front yard vegetable garden for my annuals, um, just an average sized city lot. Um, and I'm trying to do a lot with it and you can do a lot with it. We're gonna talk about specifically how to implement some of those steps um, in your own, your own space um, for the rest of the talk, for the rest of the evening. But a lot of the gardens that they were surveying were really small, they weren't huge. 100 square feet or less. So um, even if you're in an apartment or a small urban lot, it is still quite possible to grow your own food. So modern homesteading. I think that I've talked a little bit about this in some of my YouTube videos that I do and everything like that. And we are in a very um, abundant society and we have access to a lot of things and we get to make choices, which um, maybe people in our history have not necessarily had the choice. So I don't just call it homesteading or um, I call it modern homesteading because we're able to pick what resonates with us and what's most important to us. And we may not um, need to do everything ourselves. Um, but I also like to point out that we do need to have a little bit of reasoning behind our approach. Um, I don't want people to get frustrated or um, think that they would be able to completely go off the grid or completely self-sufficient in their food system on a small urban lot. Because although we can grow a lot of food in a very small space, um, we also have to be realistic. So the USDA, um, did a survey um, and statistics and ran a study. And per person, per year, um, the average American consumes 400 pounds of produce. 400 pounds of produce per person per year. And on average, now this part does vary greatly, um, but the average yield per square foot is half a pound of produce. So if we were to extrapolate that and say that we had a four-person household, a family of four, um, that's trying to grow their own food, 
um, you're going to need about 3,200 square feet dedicated solely to produce. This is not fruit. This is not grain. That is solely to produce. Um, so it is possible to grow all of your own food, even on a small city lot, but it may not be, um, it may not be what you choose. So um, I just always like to put that out there as a point of reference to conceptualize how much food you can grow in your space. Before we get started on the six steps to self-sufficiency tonight, does anybody have any questions about um, any of the statistics or um, things that I mentioned thus far? And I was, uh, I mentioned this in the beginning, um, but if you logged in after the fact, um, if you have any questions, um, you can either type them into the chat or the question and answer boxes as we're going. And then whenever we get to a good stopping point, I'll hop on over to that and answer all the questions. All right, so then on to our first step of the evening. Um, so this is jumping right into the nitty gritty. So this is saying, okay, yes, I could grow, um, you know, a couple of containers, but this is um, taking things a step further. We're going to be, sorry, June bug. Um, we're going to be trying to grow something a little bit more substantial. We might be willing to convert a portion of our yard or um, um, finding a neighbor's yard or a community garden where we can really um, put forth a little bit more effort than just a raised bed or two. So that's what this talk is going to be more focused on tonight, um, which is why the first step is sheet mulching. So although a lot of times we start with our annual vegetables, which we're going to be bringing in soil for anyhow, to build long-term soil health, even in our sandy soils, we need to sheet mulch. That's how we get the rich loamy soil that most of, a lot of, not most of, but a lot of areas in the nation have to just grow in. Um, we're having to bring it in. So um, we need to bring in that sheet mulch to build up our soil fertility so that eventually we will be able to plant in our entire yard and not just raised beds. That's a huge part of self-sufficiency, right, is not limiting ourselves to having to buy bulk soil or um, only grow in raised beds. We need to be able to grow in a larger area. Um, and sheet mulching is how we can do that in a very cost-effective way. So uh, it's great for converting um, your lawn to food. I did that in my entire front yard. I sheet mulched the whole thing um, and said, I'm done with the grass, I want food. <laughs> um, so um, they also suppress the weeds and grass without you having to till, which is um, a lot of the principles that I teach are um, more of a sustainable approach and supporting the soil ecosystem. So we're not having to turn over the soil. We're not having to use um, a tiller, which uses gas and everything like this. Sheet mulching is something that you can essentially do for free. Um, and it'll choke out the weeds and grass for you without you having to do any backbreaking work. Um, and it lasts a long time. I sheet mulched my front yard and we're looking at, I don't know, nine months later and no weeds. I have a little um, trumpet vine that's right on the edge on, on the picket fence you can see behind me that is on our lot line. Um, so that's creeping in a little bit, but um, it wasn't under the sheet mulch. So only so much you can do. But the most important aspect by far is that it's building our soil fertility. Um, so you can see this is the corner of one of my raised beds. I took this picture here uh, just, I don't know, a day or two ago when I was making this PowerPoint. And um, in just nine months time, you can see how the straight mulch um, that I started with is now turning into rich black soil in just nine months time. Uh, it's already turning into that. And so yes, it's sitting on top of sand, but when we're able to build the quality soil up top, I would say within uh, probably by next fall, I will be able to start planting in ground with a little bit of supplementation, not much at all. So that's a pretty exciting thing when you think about it. Within a year, you can have the ability to potentially plant throughout your yard. Um, it's gonna reduce the, when you build that quality soil, you don't have to water as much, you don't fertilize as much. It's just a beautiful system. So this is number one first step to self-sufficiency is expanding the space that you can potentially grow in. 
So before we move on, I see one question popped up. If anybody has any others, make sure to, um, yeah, so um, Rachel asked, is sheet mulching different from the three inch mulching we are familiar with? Yes. So sheet mulching um, is not just carbon. One, a three inch layer weeds will grow through. Um, we're talking about a six to 10 inch, um, sometimes even 12 inch, if you got enough mulch around, um, layer of mulch. And before you put that down, um, most people like to do, and that's what I did with my um, yard as well, is I put cardboard down um, or newspaper as um, an initial weed block. Um, and instead of just putting the mulch directly on top, you can do that and it will turn into soil. But if you're looking to be able to grow in the entire landscape, ultimately, that's your ultimate goal. Um, if you also add a thin layer of nitrogen below the mulch, so on top of either your sandy soil or your cardboard, you would lay a thin layer of nitrogen. And that's just allowing the fertility. So even though the mulch will break down into um, moisture retentive soil, it's not gonna have a heck of a lot of nutrients. So sheet mulching is when we're adding in nutrients so that you can ultimately grow without having very many inputs, if any at all. Does that answer your question, Rachel? All right, so Marie says, um, what examples are nitrogen um, or what is the best source for nitrogen? Uh, nitrogen is going back to the composting concept. So it would be any of our things that um, would typically rot. But what I like to use is coffee grounds because there's no order, odor, but they still have a really good um, nitrogen source. And um, barring the pandemic are quite easy to source on large large scale. So if you go to Starbucks or whatever, um, and they're, most of them are still open. Um, so you could potentially source it if you want to even now. Um, but doing a nice, uh, real thin layer of the coffee grounds is a good way to do it. Um, just because it has no odor, you can usually source large quantities of it. They give it to you by the bag, like garbage bag fulls um, at some of the larger um, coffee shops. So I liked using that. Um, the thin layer is literally just a sprinkling. Just because nitrogen is harder to um, source, you're literally just going to be sprinkling it on. It's just enough to kickstart the system um, and get a balance between the mulch and the nitrogen. So uh, a dusting almost, ba barely enough to cover the soil would be what I would do. I mean, if, you, if you're not doing a huge section and you can source more nitrogen, by all means, um, add a thicker layer. But if you're going to be converting a... Um, a lawn to garden or doing a front year garden or something like that, the, the space is typically going to be hard to source anything more than just a real thin layer. All right. So um, we are now going to go on to step two of um, self sufficiency, and that is growing annuals. So annuals are um, not just the flowers, um, annual vegetables are all of your typical garden vegetables that we often see in the grocery store or um, in people's vegetable gardens, neighbors, that kind of thing that you see growing, right? So those are your tomatoes and your lettuces and your watermelon and squash and cucumber and uh, lettuce and all of those good things. They're gonna die out every single year. They're not meant to be there forever. Um, they are quick food for us though, right? So we can plant a seed and we can potentially harvest within a couple of weeks later, depending on the crop. Radish is 21 days. If you, I just taught a um, webinar on microgreens. Um, you could have those in two weeks time. Um, so annuals are really quick to grow and start producing for us. So that's a really good place to start in your journey on self-sufficiency. Um, so you can also get regular harvest continuing throughout the year, right? So um, if you were to compare it to um, a, a tree or a perennial tree or whatnot, you're going to get probably one flush once through the year, whereas with the annual garden, we can have different crops that we're rotating through for a constant supply of food. Um, you can generally grow year round. I'm going to be teaching a webinar this weekend on growing leafy greens year round. Um, so if you're willing to shift 
what kind of produce you're eating. You can absolutely grow year round. Um, even in colder climes, um, the uh, farmer that I learned from my like post-secondary education um, in agriculture uh, was growing year-round in Wisconsin with no energy inputs besides compost. So he was not heating his hoop houses or anything of the like. He used compost to heat it. So you literally, no matter where you live in this country, can grow year-round if you choose. Um, so it's also much easier to get started in general. Um, so most crops are going to be familiar to people, so I'm not going to be trying to convince you to grow and cook a food that has cyanide in it, right? <laughs> um, which I do actually uh, think is a great idea. It's a wonderful crop to grow here. Um, but um, it's going to be a lot more familiar to people. You, Everybody knows what a tomato is. Everybody knows what lettuce is. Um, you're going to know how to cook it and prepare it. Um, it's easier to source seeds and starts for annual vegetables by a long shot. So very, um, in general, this pandemic has slightly changed that, but it's still accessible um, to source seeds and starts. When we get more into some of the perennial crops, which we'll be talking about later in the, the talk, you're going to have to start getting creative with your sources. You're going to have to find permaculture farms and um, gardening networks and communities and gardening clubs, that kind of thing. And there's also a ton of resources, um, um, educational material that you can read about on how to grow these crops. So um, I have my YouTube channel that I do weekly gardening videos on. There's tons of books on it. Um, and you can typically find somebody that's in your growing area um, to learn from as well. So in general, annuals are going to be much easier to grow. On the downside, though. They take a lot of effort and input from us, right? So we're constantly having to tend the garden, start um, new seed, change over the beds, replenish nutrients. Um, you know, they're gonna take more water because they don't have an extensive root system. There's a lot of effort that has to go into an annual vegetable garden um, compared to some of the other crops. So this is our initial starting point and you will probably always grow annuals but eventually, um, ideally, you would probably move to a system that is a little bit more self-sufficient um, and doesn't take as much input from you, ideally. So this is our phase one of our produce in our journey to self-sufficiency is growing annuals. Does anybody have any questions about that before we move on? So our third step, which may or may not seem like it is in sync, is to start composting. So especially in times like these when we don't want to go to the grocery store or we are um, really in a, in a push or a desire to start growing our own food, it's not realistic to start with composting and expect to get enough compost to fill our garden beds it's just not going to happen, especially with so many um, nitrogen um, like resources that you would typically source from your community to get the compost started um, on a large scale. Right now, so many things are shut down. So I would actually move this um, after getting your annual vegetable garden started, just because this is going to be our long-term long -term source of fertility for our site and not an immediate um, resource to depend on. So starting compost um, is critical for anybody who has half a self-sufficiency in mind. Um, it is generating fertility for your soil, so um, fertilizer, right? So if we do um, more than just a carbon pile, I have classes that I teach on composting. I have a few videos up online on how to do the process. We're not necessarily going to go into the specifics on how to compost tonight just because it's a class in and of itself. Um, but if it's well balanced, um, you're going to have really, really rich fertilizer for your garden so that instead of you having to go buy something from outside, we're going to bring it a little bit closer to home and rely on our compost as fertilizer after we get our compost spot pile producing for us. It also helps to build the soil health. So in a sustainable and resilient 
ecosystem on your on your property um, and and for that self-sufficiency element we are trying to support nature and um, all of its intricacies um, as best we can so we're trying to support soil health um, because that's what allows plants to access nutrients that's what reduces pest pressure, increases productivity, and a host of other benefits. So building soil health is absolutely essential and composting is a really, really good way to do that. Um, it also helps to close the loop in our system. I kind of highlighted that. So instead of us, you know, if you don't have the money to go buy fertilizer to replenish your annual garden beds, or if stores sell out or um, you can't, go to Walmart and pick it up or, um, you know, the demand in China for the packaging um, fails and so they're just not able to ship the fertilizers. When we are able to bring an element into our, our home and our space and our control, we're that much more um, self-sufficient. So composting is a really important part of creating a resilient system. All right, so a few questions popped up. I'm gonna hop on over there. If anybody else has any questions, go for it. Um, so Kat said, can you talk a little bit about vermiculture as well? Yeah, I can um, briefly go over it. Um, it can be a little bit complex of a system. Um, so if that's something of interest to people, I can try to get a class going um, within the next couple of weeks on it. But um, vermiculture is the, um, raising of worms. Um, you can see in that picture that's my worm bin that I had at our last house. Um, and there's a lot of different approaches and different systems that you can create for um, worms. Um, and they basically, they can either create your compost from scratch so you can feed them raw goods, uh, like produce, scraps from the kitchen. Um, and they will turn it from those raw materials directly into worm castings, which is worm poop, which is finished compost. Um, so that is definitely an option. The system that I choose and which is why it looks like that is um, I actually do um, a double, double layer, I guess. So I compost all of my compost through a hot composting pile. And then when I am done with the composting process, I then take a portion of it and feed it to my worms. So I'm actually giving them the soil and they further break it down and make the nutrients even more accessible. So that's the um, vermiculture process that you see there. So there's a lot of different techniques to it. Uh, Rachel asked, where does, um, where does come compost layer into sheet layer mulching system? Is it put in? Okay, yeah, so how, basically, if I understand correctly, um, how are we going to be using the compost in a sheet mulch situation? So it is going to be that immediate source that you would plant. So like, you know, if you have a tree that you're planting and you dig out a hole that's twice the size of the pot, that kind of concept, um, it's going to be that, that super, super fertile soil that we put in the initial planting. And then once the plant is establishing its root system and expanding from there, it's able to access the nutrients as it needs. So that's where the compost will come into play. It can be used in the sheet mulching system when you're initially getting your planting starting. And it can also help too. So um, if you sheet mulch and you wanna start getting some of your perennials growing right away, you can do before the um, sheet mulching breaks down into super fertile soil, if you just really wanna get a jump on it, you can actually put um, really high quality compost in those holes before the um, sheet mulching is even broken down really. And you will, um, the plants will still be able to get some of their nutrition from the compost and expand from there. So it's a way to like jumpstart if you want. Um, and you'll always need, if you're going to have any annual beds, which you're ev almost everybody is going to eventually like continue growing annuals, even if you have a well-established food forest, usually there's going to be patches of sunlight here and there that you're going to be working in some of your annual, annual veggies. Because regardless of whether we can grow perennial veggies year round, everybody likes a salad once in a while or some radishes to toss in. So um, 
you're likely going to still have annual beds and they do demand constant input with fertilizers and soil amendments. So that is where the compost would definitely be beneficial as well, is being able to replenish your annual garden beds without having to source from outside your, your lot or your homestead. All right, does anybody have any other questions before we move on? All right, so um, now we get to the fourth step um, out of the six steps for self-sufficiency. We've um, got immediate produce and returns from our garden in the annual beds. We've started building our soil fertility, which is gonna be critical for perennials and everything down the line. So we're starting that system going. Um, and now it's time to start considering things um, that last longer than a year or a season or a few weeks. These are our perennial fruits and vegetables. Um, and they're gonna be the long-term food source. Some of them only produce for two years, but some also produce for 200 years. So um, this is going to be long-term the end game, the vision that we have as our ultimate goal. Um, they are generally more productive systems. So you're going to have higher yields per square foot uh, when you're growing perennial vegetables. Um, they get to focus. So every time we plant an annual vegetable, it's going to start from a tiny little seed and put all of its energy into growing, right? It's got to grow from the seed into the plant that we then harvest very quickly. So um, a lot of your perennials are going to already have a system established. So instead of always having to go through that growth cycle again and again, um, they get to pro, uh, focus on production, right? On fruiting for us or um, producing leaves earlier in the season, whatever you're growing it for. Um, so they are going to be able to grow for longer during the year in general um, and be more productive while they do because they're not having to go through that energy drain of growing into a plant. They also require less effort. And if you're looking to convert your entire lot, say, um, into um, a self-sufficient system, less effort is a very good thing because there's going to be a lot of um, plants and a lot of things in your environment that are calling your attention. So the less effort we can put into the system, the better. Um, once established, most systems, if well designed, will only need very minimal maintenance on your part. Um, maybe a little bit of fertilizer uh, or some light pruning on occasion um, should be the extent of it for planting perennials. Um, some of your shorter lived crops, you know, five, two, five years, that kind of thing, you might end up having to replant. But compared to the annual vegetable garden, it's going to be much, much less effort on your part. Um, perennials are a really exciting thing to delve into. There's a few books that I would recommend on this topic. Um, one of them is Perennial Vegetables by Eric Tonsmeyer. Um, he does it for the entire country, um, but he breaks it down so that you can see exactly, and it's not by zone, um, which I actually kind of like. So he actually has maps with every single um, vegetable so that you can see where it's at. And I'm going to be sending out links to all of the books and the YouTube videos I referenced um, and all of that with the 24 hour um, recording. When I send out the email for the recording, it'll also have links to all of these. If you want to jump in and get it tonight, I would appreciate it if you do go through my website um, for any of the books or Amazon links. It just helps um, support the work that I do here. Um, so by clicking through there, it doesn't add any cost to you and it helps support my work. Um, and that can be found on my website, theurbanharvest.com. All right. So I saw a few questions pop up. Um, let's see here. Rachel asked, uh, what are some of the perennials that you grow? Um, I am still getting, so we just purchased this home this last summer, so a lot of it's still getting put in. I'm still purchasing plants like weekly, um, but I have mulberry, blueberries. Um, I have scarlet runner bean. I've got chaya, bananas, um, 
cranberry hibiscus, passion fruit, um, strawberry tree, chaya, akira, um, sweet potatoes, which can be perennial here. Um, let's see, what else, what else? Um, I've got, trying to think through, I have them all over the landscape. Um, I'm gonna be getting my, I'm finally ready, I'm getting my avocado tree um, soon here, which I'm really excited about. We're getting um, our tree, we, we're hiring our tree, tree company to come in and remove the trees I needed gone for my bigger, larger plantings. Um, but I've got a couple of different varieties of bananas. There's a, it's an amazing abundance. Um, oh, I have, um, not Serena um, cherry. I found that in the neighborhood, so I'm not planting it on my landscape just because I have Barbados cherry. Barbados cherry is like, I can't remember the exact percentage, so don't quote me here, but it's like 300 times the amount of vitamin C in one piece of fruit. So it's kind of like your daily dose of vitamin C on a tree. You just walk outside and pick one. Um, so that's going to be my vitamin tree. I've got, oh, speaking of vitamin tree, moringa, of course, that's like every permaculturist, self-sufficiency, everybody has moringa tree. That's a, that's a definite staple. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, Kat asked, is there a local nursery that you can recommend for perennials? Um, so like in the fruit tree realm of things, um, local I, jeans is really popular. Um, she does an extensive amount of um, fruit trees, avocado trees, that kind of thing, sapodillas, all of those fun things. But um, there are smaller farms, um, or not even farms, they're homesteads. They're self-sufficient food forests here in um, the St. Pete area. Earth Song Farm or um, uh, Moon Landing. Um, there's a lot of resources around and it's more, um, SUAC is a wonderful resource as well. The Sustainable Urban Agriculture Coalition, SUAC. Um, they meet monthly. Um, right now they're doing online uh, meetings, of course, but um, there are a wealth of resources. Um, so that could be something you could look into as well for perennials in the area. Uh, Nita asked, did you say blueberries? If so, what kind? Uh, I actually have six different varieties. Um, so there's a there's probably 20, maybe 30 different varieties that grow here and uh, well here in Florida. So um, we're growing um, high bush blueberries, um, not low bush, which are like the smaller fruit that you would find up north. Uh, these are high bush varieties. Um, I have an entire video on blueberries, so I'll send that out with the um, recording as well. That goes more in depth on the blueberry plantings. Uh, Marie asked, is strawberry tree different from strawberry on the bush, like the fruit that we would have in the grocery store? Yes, it looks completely different. Um, I don't know why they call it that. Uh, they are a really, really pretty um, low-lying dappled sunlight tree. Um, and it's kind of lower and low enough for the kids to pick, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and it fruits for like three quarters of the year. So it's a really nice one to have. It spreads out a little wide, but it stays low. So, um, you just wouldn't have to have the space in your yard for it, but it's a really nice tree. Um, you can, I should, you can Google images of it, but, um, it's really, really pretty. And the fruit's quite tasty. It's not like, oh my gosh, this is the best fruit I've ever had in my entire life, but it's quite quite tasty. All right, any other questions before we move on? We have one in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> she's, this is a friend of mine, Rebecca. She's listing off the perennials that I forgot to mention that I have, that she knows I have. I have Katuk, Okinawan spinach, Surinam spinach, longevity spinach. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I did hit a lot of those, um, or I have those as well. Um, it's hard to keep track of things. You just start saying, oh, I'll take that too. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see here. All right, step number five is something that I am still myself always um, expanding on and learning about. And um, I've been really excited because um, this is my first house that I've really been able to 
develop from the ground up with a permaculture approach. And that's what a lot about interconnecting systems is, is permaculture based mentality. So taking us out of the equation um, and trying to create efficiencies in the landscape and in our community, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, we're just increasing the efficiency and productivity of our landscape design. So um, let's just take as an example, I have here a picture of a chicken coop. We could just put the chicken coop in the middle of the yard and the chickens would be fine. But instead of just putting it in the middle of the yard while we're designing our landscape, maybe we put a fruit tree that has smaller fruit um, next to it and that will offer shade to the chickens and when it's fruiting the uh, Fruit that we don't harvest will drop right into the cage so they can consume it for us without us having to uh, Clean up the ground underneath the fruit tree and bring it into the chickens to eat um, And then let's say let's take it a step further and instead of us having to bring them water or to hook it up to city water we have rain catchment systems. So instead of doing a flat roof, we pitch the roof and we put water catchment onto the coop itself. So then their water is being sourced during the rainy season, right where they're at, and you don't have to transport it or purchase it from the city. And then we can do things like um, put our compost pile near it. In Florida, we get black soldier flies. Black soldier flies are a really high protein source that um, the chickens go nuts for. So if you have your compost pile next to your chickens, the um, black soldier fly larvae can feed directly into the chicken coop. So there's all of these ways to interconnect independent systems. So we just tied in our perennial fruit tree to our water catchment, to our chicken coop, to our compost. So instead of having these all function independently of each other, if we take, a take the time to think things through and to visualize things as best we can and in different arrangements and different ways they interact, considering the way they interact with each other, um, we can oftentimes create much more efficient systems than we would if we were to treat everything independently. So um, that's what... Um, is a huge part of self-sufficiency. Like I said, the less effort we're putting in because we're trying to create so much productivity in this space, um, interconnecting systems is a really important part of self-sufficiency because it's decreasing the demand on us. Um, so like I mentioned, um, we're trying to place features where they are well suited and in proximity to where they're needed. So um, instead of having the compost pile at the back of the house, you might have it near your annual garden beds. And there's going to be pros and cons for all of your systems. So it's just what works best for you. But just thinking about, hmm, it could be something as simple as placement. Instead of you having to load it into a wheelbarrow and take it to the other side of your property, maybe you... Um, compost in place or compost close to where you're going to need it the most. Different things like that. Um, we are also going to be increasing your productivity because when we um, are reducing our inputs, the time that we're spent connecting these systems together with our own energy, um, we're able to focus our efforts on the next thing, the next step, the next way to improve our system even more. So these are a lot of different concepts. There's a couple of books that I'll send out in the recommendations as well um, that are wonderful resources for this. Gaia, excuse me, um, Gaia's Garden is one of them. That's kind of your introduction to permaculture. Um, it's a wonderful book, um, but I will send out all of that um, with the recording as well. Um, Rachel asked if I can recommend a source for worm castings. Um, I used to know of a local resource that did it. Um, he wasn't super local. He was in um, Newport Ritchie, but at least he was like a flesh and blood person that I could purchase it from if I'm not growing it um, my, myself. Um, but uh, I do not know of anybody locally anymore that has worm castings. So I just purchased from Avid Brewing. Um, so I'll, here, I'll type that into the chat. Um, it's a brewing and gardening supply. Um, they are located here in St. Pete. They're about catty corner to the Tropicana Fields um, or roundabouts there. And they carry worm castings. 
Uh, Bonnie and Kevin are, they're over the bridge. They're south of us. Um, Big Earth and Palmetto, um, Palmetto and Bradenton has it. I've actually ordered from Big Earth. They also have biochar too, which is a wonderful soil amendment. Um, one that can be made on site. If you're looking for a little more self-sufficiency and resiliency in your system, you can actually make your own biochar. Um, but they do, Big Earth does carry that as well. All right, so we are going to be moving into our um, sixth system now, or our sixth step to self-sufficiency. Oh, whoops, I, I did it to panels. Thanks, Marie. Um, I will do that too. So you guys probably didn't get my email either, my bad. Um, so let me type that. Um, I didn't realize I was not sending it out to the whole group, sorry. Um, here's my website if you're looking to go order books before tomorrow evening. Um, and then what was the other thing? Oh, Avid Brewing that I had typed in. All right. So let's see here. Our sixth step is kind of the opposite of what many will think about when you're thinking about self-sufficiency. Self means yourself being sufficient, right? Um, from the rest of the community or the world. Um, but in my opinion, um, we cannot have a resilient and self-sufficient system if we don't build community as well. Um, it's all about making connections and um, having a support network in place. So I think it will help foster a realistic self-sufficiency. Um, even with the incredible product, production you can have in a very small space, um, you're not going to be able to fit everything to feed your family, like we said, probably in your lot. Maybe you can. Um, but it's going to be a lot of work. And so instead of trying to grow every single thing that you need, um, maybe you and two or three other people in your neighborhood all get together and strategize. And maybe, because you can grow avocado, let's take for example, um, you can grow avocado three quarters of the year here. But most people are not going to be able to fit 10 avocado trees on their property. So instead, why don't you plant the avocado that does early and then they do the one that's late or whatever. Or maybe you trade your avocados for their mangoes. So when mangoes are in season, you get some of theirs and then you give them some avocados and when your tree is fruiting. Um, so when we can build community and make net, um, connections like that, we're able to become more resilient because we're not having, even though it's an offsite resource that we're depending on or, or in, interacting with, it's still something that we are going to be a lot more capable of accessing and controlling in systems like these when um, we don't want to go to the grocery store, but maybe you and your neighbors have a little system set up where, you know, one of you composts because you don't have a large lot. So everybody brings their scraps to the one compost site and then you divvy it up at the end of the year. Whatever, there's a lot of different ways for us to interact with our community and to build self-sufficiency on our own landscape as well as expanding it out. Um, so you can also share things like knowledge and gardening equipment and seeds. Seeds are a wonderful example of that. You buy a packet of seeds and you have enough to plant 10 gardens um, in most cases, but you know, you don't need, you don't need half a yard full of amaranth. Um, so maybe you guys do seed shares and um, that way you don't have to expend as much money and you all still get nice fresh seed. Um, and you can also do time and work on each other's projects so that it's not always you picking away little by little at whatever you're, you're delving into. Um, maybe you trade and work on each other's projects to get things done quicker. Um, and it also creates a more resilient system in more ways than just resources. So the first two we're talking about like, you know, physical exchange of goods basically, um, or time, energy, but it also helps support a network for trying times, not just physically, but financially and mentally. If you have friends in your gardening community or people of like-minded, um, like-minded like yourself, 
that is what is going to help support you if something is off center in your life. Or if you get sick, they can come water your garden for you. Um, or if you just need to say, oh my gosh, the caterpillars got my vegetables again and I'm about to lose it. Um, you know, so it's just like it's somebody to bounce ideas off of and to vent and to just connect with. Um, so building community is absolutely, in my opinion, an essential part of forming a self-sufficient system. Um, I recently started, um, so I have my seed club and I send out three varieties of in-season seed a month and we recently expanded um, based on feedback from the group that they wanted a place to connect with each other and I I just hadn't really designed it or thought about it and it's been a beautiful thing. We've all been able to check in with each other and um, support each other and answer questions and see whose variety of whatever is growing best. Um, we just had um, one of the, the girls on the call tonight um, was able to harvest her first watermelon. And um, you know, the other one had questions about um, um, some fungus on her okra. So we're able to connect even though it's online, we're still able to build community. So it doesn't necessarily have to be neighbors or somebody you're physically coming in contact. Community can mean a lot of different things. Um, so just finding people that you can connect with and share ideas with is a really, really important part of this process. So um, does anybody have any questions before we kind of wrap things up for tonight? All right. So um, that was the six steps to self-sufficiency. And I'm going to end tonight's talk as well as begin one with a quote. And it says, resilience is all about being able to overcome the unexpected. Sustainability is about survival. The goal of resilience is to thrive. We don't just want to survive, hopefully, we want to thrive. And I think that creating a self-sufficient system on your landscape is about resiliency, not just self-sufficiency. It's about being able to do things over the long term and to do it in a way that supports and nurtures you, um, not just um, physically with food, but also mentally and in so many other ways. Um, so I just thought that was a really good way to wrap things up. Um, I will be doing, I, I know this is a lot at once, and I'm going to send out a ton of books and resources that will be a really good way um, for you to learn a lot of these concepts that I've learned over time as well. Um, I've read all of the books that I recommend, so um, they were instrumental to me getting to where I am today. Um, but I will be doing a six part course as well. I'm gonna be holding it over, starting in May. Um, we're gonna do Wednesdays and Sundays. Um, for six classes and we'll dive way deeper into each of these topics and uh, depending on the topic and how long it takes to dive into we'll elaborate into some other areas as well um, but it's all about creating that resilient self-sufficiency not just self-sufficiency so that we can thrive in whatever environment gets thrown our way so um, the classes for all six are going to be 78 um, or 15 a class. So it'll save you two bucks a class if you do the package. Um, and there's a couple of questions. We will get to all of them. Um, just in case anybody, since I did go a couple minutes over, I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. I do have the videos on YouTube. I'll send the links to the ones we specifically discussed tonight. Um, but if you have any other um, Questions. I've done a lot of introductory um, vegetable gardening topics, composting, all of that. So that's a um, resource available to you, of course, for free. Um, and then I have a ton of resources on my website as well for you to access. Um, all right, so I will go um, over to the chat box if you need to head out. Um, this will be recorded. Um, so you can always check back later and let's see if anybody actually had any questions. 
Um, lots and lots of thank yous and being part of the community. I'm so happy you're part of my community too, Bonnie and Kevin. All right, uh, let's see. All right, you're welcome, everybody. I'm so happy that this was helpful, hopefully inspiring for everybody. Um, all right. So it looks like everybody is in the support and thanks stage. So mental hug to everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. And I hope that this talk um, was a starting point for you to start delving into the amazingly productive world of self-sufficiency and how you can support yourself and your family um, even in small spaces. Um, all right, everybody, good night. If there's no other questions, I will hopefully see you on Facebook or in future classes or in the Seat Club or on YouTube, wherever. Um, I hope you all have a beautiful night.